Whenever we read the Bible, we might think, uh, we might think that God was speaking to people all of the time, like it was a regular thing, like God was popping up everywhere. And therefore, we might imagine that it must have been so much easier for the people back then to believe in God compared to today. <clears throat> but that was not the case. Often there were long intervals of silence and when nothing, nothing miraculous was happening. So, for example, between, the, between what we call the Old and the New Testaments, there were 400 years when the, when the Lord did not speak. Now, thankfully, he, he, he had uh, all that he had previously said and, and everything that he had ever promised those precious truths remained. Truths that, that we have in our Bibles as the, as the Old Testament. And of course, the Lord was still at work throughout that time, just in, in less, less obvious ways. And for our man, Abram, there were certainly periods when the Lord was silent. And one great example of that is in between chapter 16 and chapter 17. 13 years had in fact gone by. Years, when, when, years which were probably, probably quite ordinary. Years which, which were filled with all of the, all of the normal challenges and, and struggles of life. And Abram and Sarai had to, they had to live those years trusting in God's promises. Which must have been, must have been tough Especially, especially as so much of what God had promised depended on them having a baby. And that must, have seemed, that must have seemed more and more impossible as time went on. I wonder how well, I wonder how well you and I would have coped all of those years just trusting in a promise. Years when the Lord who had made that promise, well, when he seemed to have seemed to have gone quiet. But as chapter 17 begins, the Lord speaks again to Abram. Verses 1 and 2. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am God Almighty. Walk before me faithfully and be blameless. Then I will make my covenant between me and you and will greatly increase your numbers. Now, whenever we, whenever we first read that, it kind of sounds, like, sounds like God's covenant, his covenant promise is conditional upon Abram's righteousness. In other words, that, that God's covenant promises only remain valid so long as Abraham, or as Abram keeps the terms and conditions, which are that Abram must walk faithfully with God and be blameless. Sounds, sounds like a condition. But we know that can't be true, not, a, not in the sense of, of, of meriting or, or earning God's favor. It can't be true in that way because, because of what the Lord has said to Abram already. Especially, especially in chapter 12 of Genesis and, and even more so in chapter 15, which we looked at, looked at quite recently. Chapters, with the, chapters that we have thought about together over the last few weeks when, when we were introduced to the, to the glorious truth that, that, that God's eternal covenant is entirely dependent upon God's grace towards us. A relationship with him which, which becomes ours when we put our trust in the Lord and in his promises. And that even, even the faith needed to do so is a gift from God. And that when, that, that the, covenant was, that when the covenant was broken, broken by God's people, which it was again and again and again, that God promised to take the punishment upon himself You'll remember all about the, the smoke and the fire that passed between the pieces of the slaughtered animals. But God promised to take upon himself the punishment, which is precisely what happened when Christ Jesus died on the cross. That's the glorious covenant that we've been, that we've been hearing about. And, and the best bit about it is that it's not, 
dependent, it's not conditional on our righteousness. It's not depending on, on, on my personal performance in order to, to earn it. So what are these verses on the screen? What are they saying? Well, the condition or the requirement is one not of merit, but of necessity. Let me explain that. What is, uh, what is required? What is required to be, to be in covenant with God is a relationship with God. A relationship which is ours through faith in him and, and, and in what he has promised to us. So these verses, they're, they're telling us that, that, God, that God's covenant expresses a, a personal relationship between Abram and the Lord. That's, that's, what, that's what comes into clearer focus in, the, in this passage today, especially here in these opening verses. In verse 1, Abram, Abram is told to walk before the face of God Almighty, or, or El Shaddai, as some, uh, some translations will have it. In other words, God is saying to Abram, live before me, which is a beautiful picture of, of relationship with the Lord. But by phrasing it as, as walk, walk before me, we are straight away reminded of, of, of Enoch. Enoch back in, in chapter 5. You remember Enoch who, who walked with God so closely that he never had to suffer death. But the Lord simply took him, took him out of, uh, out of this world and into his presence, taken to be with the Lord. Now, walking, walking also points to, to action, and it points to purpose in Abram's life as he, as he lived it before the Lord. As one writer puts it, like riding a bike, godliness is not pursued by standing still. I, I like that, so I'm going to read it again. Uh, like riding a bike, godliness is not pursued by standing still. Abram is also told to be blameless. That's there at the end of verse 1. In other words, like, like Noah, back in chapter 6, Abram is to be, to be morally upright. As we heard back then, blameless does not mean, does not mean sinless, because no one no one except Jesus has ever lived a sinless life. Now, when Noah was described as blameless, that did not mean that, that, did not mean that Noah was sinless, but that he was a, a man of, of complete integrity, a, a God-honoring man. So together with, with walking faithful, or sorry, together with walking faithfully, being blameless describes a relationship with God, and it describes the behavior which, which fits with and, and results from that relationship. Abram was to be a man who belongs to the Lord and who lives every aspect of his life in light of that relationship. There is to be obedience to the Lord. An obedience that comes from faith. That's the very essence of what it is to be in covenant relationship with the Lord. And that's what you and I are called into when we put our trust in Jesus. Now, isn't that a, isn't that a heartwarming truth? But challenging, <laughs> challenging at the same time. So there's no suggestion in these verses that, that Abram's righteousness would ever earn him anything from God. No, God's covenant rests upon his grace as we've been hearing these past few weeks. But if we're in relationship with God, then our lives will be shaped by that relationship so that our every attitude, our every behavior will be increasingly, will, will increasingly, increasingly match that of God. In other words, we will increasingly be conformed, not to this world, but conformed to God's word, which is what Paul explains in Romans. Or think of it like this. I've, 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 I've said this before in the past, that whenever we become part of God's family, we will display the family likeness 
more and more as time goes by. Now, if you're following through the passage and you're looking at the clock, you're thinking, well, he's only looked at two verses so far and the panic's maybe starting to set in. But we've, we've thought about what we've been thinking about in these first two important verses. It's all about the, the pledge of the promise, which is the first half of this morning's title. Next, we need to think about the second half, or the second part of this morning's uh, title. We need to look at the sign of the covenant which is circumcision. But don't panic, as I've said, don't panic because we can pick up the pace as we look at the rest of this chapter just now. Now, we've just heard the the emphasis on the need for personal righteousness. And there'll be a little bit more of that in a few verses time. But first there comes, uh, first there are further reminders of of the gracious nature of the covenant, as God stresses that it is all by his own initiative. He does that by a whole list, a whole sequence of of statements, each one beginning with, I will, I will, I will, I will. You'll see it there in verses uh, 4 through to verse 8. And so again, there's there's not even the slightest hint that God's covenant must be be merited or earned by Abram. No, instead we see see blessing piled upon blessing. We see grace upon grace. Even though Abram had already been promised many descendants, now here in verse 4, he is promised even more. So much so that in verse 5, the Lord changes Abram's name, a name which means mighty father. The Lord changes it to Abraham, which means father of a multitude. We, We thought about that in the kids' talk earlier. And from him, God would produce not just one nation, but nations, plural, and kings. So not just the Israelite nation and the generations that followed, but other nations too. Therefore, the covenant referred to here in these verses, especially in verse 7, that covenant and its blessing should be understood as, as extending beyond the nation of Israel to other nations as well. That was something which lay much much later in the future, long after these words were spoken to Abram. And you and me, if we as non-Jewish people, if we are part of the family of God today, then we are living proof that the Lord kept this promise. But that, that extending of the covenant didn't start recently. No, it goes right back into the Old Testament itself, as we see in today's passage. And in verse 8, the promise of that the land of Canaan would belong to Abram's family. In verse 8, we see that promise reaffirmed as well. Next then, there's something very new, because as verses 9 through to 14 explain, from now on, the covenant is going to have its own physical sign. This is the bit that we didn't talk about in the kids' talk. I'll leave it up to parents to decide when they have that conversation with their, with their kids. So that mark, that sign of the covenant would be circumcision, the practice of cutting away of the foreskin. Now in time for, for Abram's descendants, circumcision as a sign of the covenant, circumcision would become, would become almost synonymous with God's covenant. You just simply, simply, simply couldn't separate the two. That's how, how closely linked the covenant and its sign were to become, which is what we witness in these verses. But why did the Lord wait? Why did he wait until this point to introduce this covenant sign of circumcision? Why did, why did God not introduce it sooner on any of the previous occasions when, he, when he, he had spoken with Abram about the covenant? Why now? Well, the answer has to do with what was about to happen. It's because the, it's because the child promised by God, the child who would be, would be heir to Abram, an heir of the covenant, that child was about to be conceived. Abraham was about to father his first and only son. And so Abraham must be circumcised 
Abraham must receive the sign of the covenant so that this child would be heir of that covenant. That covenant, he would be Abraham. Eh, Isaac would be heir of that covenant after him. The same would be, would be true of all subsequent, uh, all subsequent conceptions within the people of God. The children, girls as well as boys, would become part of the covenant community if they were conceived by a father who had been circumcised. And so, so on from generation to generation. Sometimes we might think that the, that the covenant that God made was only with the boys. But no, every child who was conceived by a father who was circumcised was within that covenant. And this, this token bloodshed which resulted from circumcision, it would continue until the Messiah. It would continue until the Christ comes. And then by a much greater act of bloodshed, the sacrificial death of Christ on the cross, then the sign of circumcision would no longer be required would no longer be needed because Christ would fulfill all that circumcision had promised, all that, all that circumcision had pointed forward to. Now, Abram didn't know any of this. And he, he didn't know any of this because it was all, all going to follow. But he trusted God. These verses tell us how he was obedient to God's command. And today, if we are, if we are believers, then we should thank the Lord for making us members of his covenant people. By making us part of that covenant through, through Christ's death and resurrection. Now there's not time for us this morning to look at how baptism replaced circumcision as the sign of God's covenant. I'm simply going to read a passage from, sec, from Colossians chapter 2. I'm going to read the passage and I'm going to leave it up to you to make the connections for yourselves, to join the dots with the help of the Holy Spirit. This is Colossians 2, verses 11 to 13. In him which is in Christ, in him also you were circumcised by a circumcision made without hands, by putting off the body of the flesh, by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith, in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. And you, who were dead in your trespasses and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses. I'm going to urge you to, to look at those verses again later on today, perhaps wrestle with them a little bit, try and figure out the connections. And if, if, if you wish, you're more than, more than happy if you want to uh, get in contact and we can chat about those together. But hopefully, hopefully you can already see how some of the pieces fit together. Now that brings us then to the closing verses of, of Genesis 17, where Abram's encounter with God at, at age 99 doesn't just lead to his name being changed, but to Sarah's too. Because from now on, from now on, Sarai would be Sarah. Now, Sarai had meant my princess, a name given to her by her father, who, who no doubt, like, like all dads, thought of her as his princess. But her new name, this new name, Sarah, simply means princess. And it's a subtle difference, but it's important because, because among her descendants, there would be kings. That's verse 16. Now Abraham's response to all of this is, is less than what we might have hoped for because we're told in verse 17, Abraham fell down, sorry, fell face down. He laughed and said to himself, will a son be born to a man a hundred years old? Will Sarah bear a child at the age of 90? It seems that the those years of waiting, well, they, they hadn't necessarily hardened Abraham's heart. They hadn't necessarily caused him to doubt God. But those years of waiting had certainly lessened his expectations, his expectations of what the Lord was going to do in order to, to fulfill 
the promises that he had made. Because not only does Abraham laugh at the renewed promise that he and Sarah would have a child of their own, that they would become parents in their old age. No, he also offers Ishmael to the Lord as an alternative heir, an alternative heir to God's promise. That's in verse 18. But the Lord remains resolute. He remains resolute that Abraham and Sarah would have a son and that he, this son, would be the one through whom God's promises would continue. And then they would laugh. They would laugh with joy, which is what their new son's name will mean. Because when he's born, he's to be given the name Isaac. Yes, Ishmael. Ishmael will be important too. We heard that last week in chapter 16. And it's here in chapter 17 at verse 20 as well. But the covenant, the covenant will pass to Isaac. We're told that in verse 21. Isaac, who will be born to Abraham and Sarah at the same time the following year. In the remainder of chapter 17, we witness, we witness Abraham's obedience to all that, all that the Lord has commanded, to all of his instructions. As we're told how he and, and every male in his household, every one of them were circumcised, including Ishmael and including Abraham's servants, who were clearly not his offspring. So yes, the, the covenant would pass to Isaac and then to his seed after him. But the blessings of the covenant, those blessings embrace, embrace everyone and, and anyone linked to Abraham. So already, already Gentiles were being, were being included among God's people to enjoy God's blessing. Our time this morning is, is up but let me, let me finish by reading some verses from Romans chapter 4. Romans 4 verses 16 and 17. And again, I'm going to leave it up to you to join the dots. And I'm going to give you again that if, if, if you would like to chat to me about it, then we can do that afterwards too. But this is Romans 4 verses 16 and 17. And with this, we finish today. Therefore, the promise comes by faith, so that it may be by grace and may be guaranteed to all Abraham's offspring, not only to those who are of the law, referring to the Jews, but also to those who have the faith of Abraham. That's us as Gentiles. He is the father of us all. As it is written, referring to quotations from today's passage, as it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. He is our father in the sight of God, in whom he believed, the God who gives life to the dead and calls into being things that were not. Amen. Let's uh, take a few moments just now and let's, uh, let's pray together.